everybody and welcome to Friday's Live. It's the best time of the week. So let us know uh, where you're tuning in from. Um, I'm coming to you today from London. Uh, I was hoping to say that spring was going to be in the air, but it's it's been a really chilly and rainy day here in the capital. Um, so let us know where you're tuning in from, how you're doing today. And we've got the wonderful Ellie in the comments. So do say hello uh, to Ellie. And yeah, we've got a bit of a packed agenda for you today. As ever, we've got our new records of the week and we're going to be taking a little look at tracing those illegitimate uh, Victorian ancestors. So we're going to be looking at some tips and tricks uh, for that. So, ooh, and also our question of the week, uh, which we'll come back to later. Um, so I was at the London Book Fair this week, which is a huge event in Kensington Olympia. Really wonderful. And it, it got me thinking about our question of the week. So that's going to be, um, if your family history was turned into a book or film, what would the title be? So if your family history was turned into a book or a film, what would its title be? I see some people tuning in here. Hello, Sarah from Wexford. We've got Beth tuning in from Cal uh, California. Hello, Victoria. We've got Marilyn from New Jersey. Shirley saying over on YouTube that it's lovely and sunny here in South Cambridgeshire. Shirley, send us your sunshine. We need your sunshine. And we've got Gina tuning in from Lincolnshire. Hello, everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, so let, let's dive in, shall we? And uh, have a look at have a look what's been going on in the world of uh, new uh, records. <laughs> am I am I am I in the fog? Maybe <laughs> need to improve my lighting. Um, ah, we've got um, Liam's joining us. Raining in Devon. <laughs> Janet uh, over on YouTube. She's got she's got the sun. Okay, so new records. Let's let's have a look at these today. Um, uh, we've got uh, updated records uh, from the Diocese of Dublin this week covering marriage licences, uh, Dublin, Wills and Grants as well, as well as three brand new newspapers uh, from Guernsey and also from London, from London's East and from London's West. And a really fun fact this week, we've actually passed um, 67 million pages on our newspaper collection. So that, that's an incredible landmark, um, eyeing up the 70 million next. So let's dive into these uh, new records of the week. Um, we've got more joining. Hello, Sue Moon over on YouTube. Uh, it's brightening up in Guildford. That, that's good to hear. We've got Heather from Edinburgh and Jean over in Preston with mixed weather. Yeah, it truly is. It's been proper April weather, sunshine and showers. Uh, but we'd just like a little bit more spring in the air. So look, let's dive into our uh, Diocese of Dublin marriage licences. Now, there are nearly 100,000 um, of these, and these they span the years 1638 to 1858, and they cover the counties of Dublin and Wicklow, large parts of County Kildare, as well as parts of counties Carlow and Leash. So County Leash uh, was known as uh, Queen's County. So what these records consist of, they're books that were published in the 1890s, regarding these records that were made between 1638 and 1858. So what these records are, they are an index. And what you'll see on the um, original image when, when you look at this collection, you'll see uh, page numbers and they link to the, back to the original records. These original records were sadly lost uh, during the fire at the Four Courts in 1922 when so much Irish genealogical material was destroyed. So what can um, these records tell you? Uh, you will find the names and address of the bride and groom, and sometimes you even get occupations. Uh, you will find the, the year of the event and the nature of the event, um, various uh, variations on the marriage license theme. So uh, allegations, license bonds and uh, caveats. Then we've got a shout out from Sue Moon. Uh, good to see some Kildare records there. They are so sparse. So any, any, new, any new Irish records? So useful. Um, so yeah, oh, and I included a little picture here of an Irish wedding um, from the Illustrated uh, Illustrated News. This is one of our wonderful Victorian titles. It looks like quite a jolly affair. So let's let's look at what these records actually look like. So uh, they are, yeah, I'm looking at the right thing. Yeah, um, they are uh, transcripts here on the um, uh, the left hand side. Got Matthew. Um, had no sound at the start. Uh, Ellie, are we hearing? Are we hearing me all right? 
Yes, all good. Okay, sorry about that. Maybe rewind um, when when we finish up and um, we'll, we'll come back to the question of the week, Matthew, as well. So uh, this is the transcript we can see on the top left here. This is for uh, Diana Callahan, who married a George Prince Dowdle in 1773. And it is so great to have this old Irish material. Um, we know how difficult uh, Irish uh, fa tracing Irish family history can be. So this set is uh, hugely, hugely useful. And uh, let's, it's, it's really good with this, this particular set to have a look at that corresponding image. So you'll see that it is in index form here and it's grouped by surname. So all the Callahans are listed here. So that could be particularly useful if you're researching a particular family group. You might find corresponding records uh, under, under, that, um, under that surname. And one thing to say uh, about these records uh, that I actually missed before is that they're for the Diocese of Dublin. So that is the uh, Evangelical um, Episcopalian Protestant um, Church. Uh, so, um, that, yeah, that, that, they're Anglican records as well. So one really important thing to note there with this set. And we can see uh, Diana Callahan's uh, record here just about halfway down and uh, next to it you'll see you'll see the year 1773 and the acronym um ml so ml in this case standing for marriage license and you will also see that there were other acronyms on this image so you've got w's i's ow's and in the information about this record set you'll find a comprehensive list of all these acronyms so that's just super useful to refer back to and um Yes, and they also feed into the wills and grants set, which we'll, we'll take a look at um, a bit later. And uh, but before we move on to that, I just wanted to uh, show you this. And this uh, this is from the Betham Genealogical Abstracts Collection. This is another record of uh, Diana and uh, George Prince Dowdle's wedding. And we learn, I just love the name George Prince Dowdle. I think it's wonderful. Uh, he's a soldier in the 45th Regiment of Foot. And his regiment, the 45th foot was raised in 1741 and at the time of George's marriage 1773 it was in the brink of seeing action in the um, uh, American War of Independence in 1776 so perhaps George would go on to fight in that conflict and the regiment then became the Nottinghamshire or Sherwood Foresters Regiment uh, following the American War of Independence and that was actually on request of the county of Nottinghamshire they wanted to have this regiment uh, affiliated to them so anyway, back to the record, uh, we can see that Diana is also listed as a spinster and that the marriage was in uh, St. Peter in Dublin. Right, from um, wedding bells to funerals, well, not quite funerals, but to the Diocese of Dublin's wills and grants. So as you will see, this set is very closely connected with the marriage license set. They are recorded in those same books that were produced during the 1890s. So we're looking at, at the same coverage of uh, the Diocese of Dublin, that, that Anglican diocese covering the various counties of Dublin, Wicklow, Kildare, Carlow and Leash. Uh, and there are older records in this set as well, uh, going back all the way to 1270, quite remarkable, with nearly uh, 35,000 names. And you'll get the first and last name, uh, the year of the will, and also sometimes an occupation. So again, you need to uh, take a look at the original image to see that the, uh, the specific type of record to learn what that is. And again, this is where that acronym list comes in really handy. So you'll, you'll see whether it's OW, that's original will, or W for the will, probate or grant. Um, there's I for intestacy. And there's a few more. You get the gist of it. But there's that wonderful list of all those acronyms uh, for this set, which, is, which has been really super useful in, in deciphering them. And so you'll see an example here of uh, the original record index, and you'll see um, some MLs, some marriage license mixed into the set as well. Um, and these ones, these, I picked these out because they, they included some really historic ones. Uh, I'm looking, it's quite small, um, but you can see that we, we're going back to sort of 1595, 1611 here. And there are two particularly um, old ones from, from the, that, those years uh, for the surname of Birmingham, and we've got a William Birmingham from 1595 and another William Birmingham from 1611. Oh, 
So we are going back a really, really long way here. And what I like about this set, this, this information, is that we get the alternative spellings, which I think is so useful, especially when you're researching Irish uh, family history. So alternatives for this spelling of Birmingham, you've got Bremen, Bremingham. And you also get a location, so from uh, 1595, William, he's from Dublin. And uh, our 1611, William, he is from um, Clonkeren or Clonkeren. Um, I'm having to brush up on my Irish pronunciation this week. Last time I was on, it was um, Paddy's Day. So I'm very Irish themed in, in our lives. Uh, and uh, in the other records, you'll see there are professions. Uh, Richard uh, Birmingham is a uh, tailor. Uh, he, his record was from 1755. And Robert Birmingham is, uh, he's listed as a coach owner. And what coach trying about the coach owner? I found that quite an interesting one. And his record is from 1764. Both men are from Dublin. And we get some really lovely information here. Uh, for example, uh, we have Mary Birmingham, but we learn she has an alternative surname of Cooper sack and that she's a widow and her her record dates back to 1678 um but perhaps my most my favorite entry on this list is peter the pat uh, birmingham so he's literally recorded his nickname peter the pat <laughs> and he's from um dunboyne in county meath so he really does sound like um quite a character all the way um from 1633 I'm seeing some really um, lovely answers coming through the question of the week. I promise we'll, we'll come back uh, to those answers very, very soon. Uh, just just going to pop in some newspapers, though. First, it's me. We, we, need, we always have to look at newspapers. Um, but we really have some treats for you this week, a trio of new titles. And we've got the wonderful uh, Guernsey Evening Press and Star joining us this week. And it continues to be published to this day as the only daily newspaper in Guernsey. And it first appeared in July 1897 in St. Peter Port and aimed to give um, local affairs minute attention and a short, crisp summary of the news of other parts of the world. Uh, so we've got the years 1897 through to 1916 for this title. Um, it's a really, a really fascinating one. And actually, during the Second World War, during the Nazi occupation of Guernsey, it was a census. And we've also added the Richmond and Twickenham Times this week as well. So this was uh, founded in Richmond, uh, in Surrey, uh, what was Surrey, uh, in 1873 by 26-year-old um, Edward King. It's very young to found a newspaper. And he intended it to be an epitome of local events and a readable journal for all classes and of, yeah, of interest to every resident. Now, um, Edward King was editor of this newspaper for 21 years, and it actually had quite a tragic ending for poor Edward. He actually um, ended up being put into asylum, an asylum, sadly. And it was at this point that the Dimbleby family took over. So, yeah, that Dimbleby family. Uh, it was edited by Richard Dimbleby from 1946, and uh, David Dimbleby followed in his footsteps in 1965. And our final uh, new newspaper this week is the Eastern Post. So we've got West London representation with Richmond and then we're going to the other side of the city now with the Eastern Post. And it was actually published in uh, Whitechapel and it covered the East End of London from 1868 onwards. And it was very much a workers paper, a paper that belonged to the people. And uh, its opening statement um, is, it will be written not for the party, but for the public. It will be written by honest men for honest men. And actually, it became for a little while the organ of the General Council of International Workings Men's Association from February 1871 to June 1872. So the International Working Men's Association, that was a, that was a group of um, socialists, communists, anarchists, trade unionists, uh, and it, it was really to sort of unify all, the, all those disparate philosophies. And the Eastern Post had some really, really interesting readers in this sphere, including famed communist philosophers Karl Marx and Friedrich uh, Engels. And the absolute uh, gem in this newspaper, The Eastern Eye, is that Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels actually wrote to the Eastern Post. Uh, so they wrote directly to the editor. So you will find letters syndicated across the press at this time. But Marx and Engels actually wrote directly to this newspaper, which, which is very special. And um, we have this uh, example here from December um, 1871, written by Karl Marx himself. Uh, it's a spirited riposte to Charles Bradlaugh. 
who was a political activist who founded the uh, National Secular Society. Now, Bradlaugh had denounced Marx as a Bonapartist, and Marx had decided to turn the other cheek and treat him with contemptuous silence. And that is until he published this letter. And he ends it with the following line. If he be kind enough to clothe his libels in a more tangible shape, I shall betray him to an English law court. So quite the threat there from Marx. And it really belies the fragmentation of the International Working Men's Association. It didn't last. Um, there was rifts between the Marxist and the anarchist elements. And in case you've never been, I had to include this wonderful picture of Marx's grave in Highgate Cemetery. This is from the Illustrated London News uh, from 1955. Um, Highgate Cemetery is one of my favourite places in the world. I, we love a cemetery, but, but Highgate, um, if you're ever in London or you're in London, go to Highgate. And uh, yeah, absolutely a fascinating snippet of history there. And now for your family history. And um our question of the week. So the question of the week is if your family was if your family history was turned into a book or a film, what would its title be? And yes, it's um it's, it's a difficult one, Shelley says, <laughs> needs thinking about. Um, and yes, I, but I have seen some answers coming through. So I'm just going to, to scroll through and and, and take a look. Um, but Daphne comes, snaps back. Who do you think you are? Wonderful stuff. <laughs> um, and <laughs> I don't, Liam, I want to boil your head. I'm not, I don't. I'm, I'm sure Lynn will explain that to me. Uh, <laughs> um, I like it, I think. Um, <laughs> I need to brush up on my Scots, I think. I've been I've, I've been immersing myself in Irish histories. So I need to need to brush up on my Scots. Um, and you've got Janet. Um, who's the daddy? Uh, my two times great grandmother, five illegitimate, illegitimate children, then she married. This is very on topic, actually, uh, for today's session. We're going to be looking at um, illegitimacy, uh, in, in Vict especially within the, the Victorian era. And I, I love that title, Who's the Daddy? That's going to be quite apt um, for, for what I'm talking about um, in a bit. Um, <laughs> and um, I will, will Ellie's answer. I think my answer to the question of the week would be for the love of chocolate. Yeah, yeah, that that was me um, last night after a long day at the book fair, sat on the sofa with a box of beautiful Belgian chocolates. Um, uh, this, this Ellen, I think this needs to be published. This is an excellent title. Uh, 400 Years, the Blending of the Ethnicities in an American Family that Didn't Always Follow the Rules. Well, I want to read that. Please write and share that with us, Ellen. That's great. And we've got Kim. This sounds intriguing as well. We've got sort of a murder mystery theme here with um, Kim Billy. My fourth great grandmother's story would be Who Put Arsenic in the Cake? Wonderful, wonderful stuff. Um, and Janet, <laughs> another answer here. Uh, quarrying for ancestors, research into my main line of research, the surname quarry. We love a pun here. I think Ali and myself are probably the, the people who appreciate a pun the most. So <laughs> I do love that. Um, <laughs> and Ellen here, less serious side, a plethora of Marys, Franks, Josephs and Williams. Yes, I think, uh, I think I'm going to add in Anne's there. The, uh, and the, the, my family tree we'll be talking about a little bit later. It has so many Anne's. We have um, Anne, and then we have her sister Mary Anne, and then you know, just just the love of the name Anne. Um, let's see if there's any more. Uh, Marilyn, uh, lives of service, trees full of firefighters, military service, and volunteers in the Red Cross. That's fantastic, and to have that, to have that sort of that uh, continuity across. That those lives of service and you often sort of find that in different parts of um, a tree finding those themes I know with my my father's family tree um, one side there's a Baptist minister and then found out fairly recently on the other side there's a Methodist lay preacher so um, ours would sort of be more we'd have a sort of more church uh, theme uh, there and this one I love from Sue Moon over on YouTube, where are you lot hiding? Yes, yes, uh, especially, especially up for those, 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 um, those brick walls. Um, this, this is good. Um, there's, there's a lot of books that need to be written here. Uh, uh, with Victoria, Love and Heartbreak, Coincidence and Traits. Oh, lovely title. Um, some really good ones coming through. Um, 
Oh, and Liam has clarified. Thank you, Liam. Uh, away and bore your head. Get lost in Scotland, effectively. Okay. <laughs> I love that. I'm going to borrow that. Okay. <laughs> There's still more questions. Um, but yeah, head boiling in Scotland. I think Liam owes us a session on that. Uh, <laughs> um, Karen De Bruyne, we've got Tinker Taylor Soldier Spy. Love that. Um, and Karen, there's so many good ones coming through. This is, I think everyone's exercising their creative juices and I really like to see that. Uh, a book from my dad's side of our family history, Keeping Up with the Joneses in Victorian England. Wonderful. Uh, on my mum's side with a maiden name of Street, A Long Walk Down Memory Lane. Wonderful stuff. Um, so you've got Jean, who... Um, who that there is a book on her Domville uh, maternal family that came over with a conqueror. And so I know there's a breakaway to Ireland, so I'll be checking uh, that out. Ooh, very, very, uh, very, very interesting there. And so amazing to be traced, to go all the way back uh, to the conqueror as well. Um, Liam, it sounds worse than it is, honestly. Okay, okay. I trust you, I trust you. Um, and uh, Matthew, um, where are the greys or what's McDonald's? Wonderful stuff. Uh, <laughs> or Matthew again, or no more Smiths. <laughs> yes, I think um, we were a few tuned in uh, to the session on Tuesday with uh, uh, Ellie and Jessamy from the National Archives discussing brick walls. Uh, the surname Smith uh, came up a bit in, and how difficult that can be with, with brick walls. But go, if, you, if you haven't already, do give that session a watch. There's some excellent uh, tips that are, I'm, I'm going to be trying out to, to sort of break down um, some of my brick walls. Um, uh, pickles, would you believe it? Absolutely. <laughs> That's a good one too. Um, <laughs> Janet, we, we've got, I know we've got some um, some dark horses in our family tree, incorrigible, incorrigible rogue or career criminal. Um, so yeah, that's a great, great one. So yeah, keep them, keep them coming. Um, and I, I actually haven't thought about what mine would be yet. So I'll, I'll, I'll get there. Um, and uh, let, let's, uh, let's move on um, to our next section. So this, this perhaps could be the title of my book. I mean, it's not, it's not especially catchy. Um, but this, this is a theme within my tree is Victorian illegitimacy. Um, so yeah, as I said, my, my, my family tree is peppered with um, illegitimacies. Uh, and, and, you know, attitudes, of course, have changed hugely since Victorian times. Um, but it was fairly common in Victorian times for a child uh, to be born outside of wedlock during this period. And um, just because it wasn't sort of approved of or the done thing at the time, what it doesn't mean is that it didn't happen. It happened a lot. Um, but this can make tracing family trees that little bit harder to trace. Uh, so let's look, we're going to look at some tips and tricks for, for tracing those, um, those ancestors who were uh, illegitimate. And um, sometimes these illegitimacies, they are hidden and they are masked. So we need to work that little bit harder to decode those clues from the past. So I'm now going to step through um, discovering um, some illegitimate Victorian ancestors and just yeah, having a look um, at uh, some ancestors born out of wedlock in this period. And I'm going to start with a, uh, a family photograph, actually. Um, and this is like this is one of my um, sort of treasured possessions. Uh, and it, sh it shows a branch of my family, the Cooper family. And they are photographed in their home at in Iver uh, in Buckinghamshire. So that's sort of it's just just sort of outside a, a Windsor. And so they're shown in, in the 1890s. And there are four generations uh, sat, uh, shown here uh, from baby Harry Cooper um, all the way through to um, uh, Mariah uh, Cooper, who's he's the, he's the old lady seated on, on, on the right hand side. And you can see some, some excellent um, uh, quest, uh, quest answers coming through to question of the week. <laughs> You're Karen, the, the good, the bad and the dodgy. <laughs> and there's a bit of a recurring theme here about uh yeah 
give them fibbers, <laughs> a lesson in how to lie through your teeth. Yes, I, I feel that might that resonates. Um, yes, in, in, in with many, <laughs> many of our ancestors, not known for telling the truth. Um, so I guess, the, and this is a theme that could, could come into uh, this, this family group here. And the three of these, uh, well, four of these people actually are my direct ancestors. Um, the lady on the top right there is my great, great grandmother. And there is a really uh, strong resemblance actually to my mum, uh, which is it's so striking, uh, given given the uh, the gap the gap in um, gap in time and uh, my great 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 grandfather Henry is holding uh, the dog there very cute and uh, next to him great 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 grandmother uh, and Elizabeth and um, it's been a real privilege um, to be able to explore their stories a little further and uh, for this story we're just gonna we're gonna focus on Anne um, here so Anne is the lady um, holding the holding the little baby there and uh, she she says she's my 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 three times uh great grandmother yes she does my the um thank you pickles <laughs> my um my my two times great grandmother she she has this poise she has a real elegance um which is um yeah it's quite striking um and um so yeah, I think I think in later life, from what I've heard, she's sort of turned into looking a bit more like this lady here. Um, but bless them. Okay, so this is Anne, and this is Anne Cooper, and uh, we see in the nineteen eleven census that she um, uh, was born in Iver in Buckinghamshire, so that's where she was living with her husband uh, Henry, and she's sixty three at the time of the nineteen eleven census, so she, and she's two years older than her husband. So we can estimate that she was born in. 1848, uh, which makes her in her, her in her late 40s or early 50s at the time um, of this photograph. And so they just sort of look a bit older than you were back then. Uh, and we can see from uh, our marriage registrations that Henry Cooper married Anne Whedon in 1872. And the district is Eton, where they were married. Uh, so Eton is, is very near to Ivor. And we've now learned Anne's maiden name. Anne's maiden name is Whedon. And uh, we find Anne, we Anne Whedon, uh, born in 1848 in the censuses of 1851, 1861 and 1871. And they're all, uh, she's always living in Ivor in Buckinghamshire. And in 1851, she's living in her grandparents' home. And her grandparents are Richard and Anne Whedon. And Richard's a labourer. And here she's recorded as Anne E. Whedon. So we learn of a middle name. And... Ten years later, when she is now 13, she's still living in her grandparents' home. She's still living with Richard and Anne. So at this point, I'm beginning to wonder who Anne's parents are. Um, so she's got an aunt living with her, Eliza, uh, in both the 1851 and 1861 censuses. But Eliza's only eight years older, so that's, that's going to rule her out as being Anne's mother. Uh, and there's another aunt uh, or potential mother listed in the 1851 census, that's Hannah, and she's at, she's 22 in the 1851 census to um, and, and three years old, so, there's, so that could be possible. And again, we don't really get much information from the 1871 census. Uh, age 23, Anne is working as a nurse. So she's moved out of um, the family home and she's working for a man called Richard Belcher. Uh, so this is a year before she married. So the censuses aren't really giving us much help here in indicating her her parents. So at this point in time, we know we know a few things about Anne. Um, we know where and when she was born, uh, where and when and who she married, and where she was living in several decades. But what we don't know is the name of her parents and uh, also what, what the E stands for. Um, so her birth record fills in some of these gaps. Uh, we learn that her full name is Anne Elizabeth Whedon, and it's spelled slightly differently here. Um, it's traditionally spelled D-O-N, but it's spelled D-E-N here. So the further levels of difficulty. Uh, and we learn that she was born in, uh, in Q4 of 1848. But you'll note that her mother's maiden name isn't listed, and it's not in the original document. So this usually signals that uh, the, the, the surname of the, the child is the same as the mother's surname. So it indicates here that Anne has been born outside of wedlock. 
um, or in, if indeed the maiden name is given and it's the same as the child, uh, this would indicate again illegitimacy. So it then became a bit difficult when I stumbled across uh, this baptism record. Um, and this is for an Anne Elizabeth Whedon, who was baptised in Cowley on the 22nd of October 1848. And she was the daughter of, uh, of Robert, a labourer, and Mary. Um, so Cowley, Google, this is where Google Maps is always, always a friend. I had to look it up. Uh, it's, it's very close to either, uh, where we know Anne was born and where she grew up. And indeed, this baptism record even gives the residence as either. So now I'm about as sure as I possibly can be that this record relates to Anne Elizabeth. So I have the name of her parents, uh, Robert and Mary. Um, and, but things in this case, they're not that simple. And indeed, when are they ever? <laughs> and that is, that is always part of the fun of um, solving these kinds of mysteries, because there is no record of a marriage that I could find between Robert and Mary. So no marriage between a Robert Whedon and a, a lady named Mary, or indeed the other way around, no Mary Whedon's marrying a Robert. Um, so nothing was really fitting. So where did I head? Newspapers. And uh, using our wonderful newspaper collection, um, searching for Mary Whedon in 1848 turned up a prodigious amount of results. And there were many of them. And this is this is always what I find so fascinating about our newspaper collection that Mary Whedon in 1848 isn't really anybody of note. Um, you know, she, she is a, a simple um, country woman, and yet there are lots of mentions of her in our newspapers. And, and why, why is this? Well, it's all centers around her daughter, Anne Elizabeth. So we're just gonna, just gonna dive in. Um, our journey through these newspaper pages starts on the left uh, with a, uh, an article from the Bucks Herald, which was published on the 25th of November, 1848. And what it details is the police sessions that were held at um, the Crooked Billet, which is a pub, wonderful name, um, in Ivor Heath. And this is where Mary Whedon pops up for the very first time. And uh, the relevant entry reads, um, on the complaint of Mary Whedon of the parish of Ivor, an order of affiliation was made on Robert Edwards, under which he was required to pay two shillings per week towards the maintenance of the illegitimate child of the complainant and one pound, 12 shillings and six pence costs of application. Mr. Gardner attended for the defendant. So what is happening here is that Mary is getting Robert Edwards to essentially pay child support for her illegitimate child, Anne. So here in black and white, is Anne's status is as illegitimate. And we're gonna look at this a little bit later on, um, but there were specific changes to the poor law in 1844 that meant whereas before the Board of Guardians had to initiate a hearing at the Petty Sessions to determine the identity of a child's father and then make him pay, towards the child's upkeep. In 1844, this changed so that the woman or the mother of the child could initiate her the proceedings herself. So this is exactly what Mary is doing here. She is taking that initiative. She is taking Robert Edwards before, before authorities and making him pay towards the upkeep of their child. So Mary's quite a, a pioneer here, but all didn't go to plan for Mary. So. We get, we get a sense a couple of months later that things aren't quite going to plan. Uh, again, we're at the Crooked Billet in the, in the, on the 3rd of February, 1849, with a report in the Bucks Herald. Uh, and really one thing to note with these cases, these, these paternity cases, that they were reported on extensively, as I found in the case of Mary. So even if, if you have an ancestor like Mary, who's, you know, not, you know limited means, um, uh, fairly ordinary, it's likely that such a case would be reported down in the local press. Um, so it's likely that you'll be able to find uh, corresponding newspaper reports. So the next we read about Mary is um, in February 1849, and the defendant, uh, the alleged husband, Robert, uh, sorry, the alleged father rather, Robert Edwards was brought up on a warrant because he hadn't paid his maintenance money. And Mr. Gardner, he becomes a key figure, the lawyer, uh, Robert Edwards' lawyer, has the case adjourned. And um, he, he is a key player in all of this. 
So we, we get a bit more detail in the Windsor and Eaton Express. So this is the Windsor and Eaton Express is on, on, on the right hand side here. And there was so much in this article. It, I've had to condense it. It was extremely long and it was filled with all sorts of legal jargon, which does make it quite hard to follow. Um, one little gem, first and foremost, was that I learned where um, Robert Edwards was from. He's from um, Harlington. So that's a lovely little clue there to, to help us learn a little bit more about Robert. But the gist of this very long article is that Robert Edwards has refused to pay his maintenance. And the inference here is that he believes he's not the father of Mary's child. And he was seeking a certiorari, Latin word, uh, and this is a, a writ or order whereby a higher court reviews the case of um, the lower court. And um, he he um, he got one. Uh, a report from a bit later on, from the fifth of May, eighteen forty nine, uh, from the Windsor and Eaton Express, tells of how the magistrate's order for Robert Edwards to pay maintenance was quashed by the Queen's Bench. So it went up that high. It went up to the next level, basically. And um, he had his amount uh, paid for him, uh, fifty pounds of bail, by uh, Thomas and John Edwards and uh, Charles Newman. And the matter still rumbles on. We're sort of in, a year later after the initial report. We're into the we're into the autumn, uh, the first of September, eighteen forty nine. And this this snippet reads: um, Robert Edwards appeared on a complaint of Mary Whedon of Ivor, charging him with being the father of her illeg illegitimate child. The de the defendant objected to the case being proceeded with on the ground that an order had already been made against him for the same child, which order had been removed by writ of certiorari from the quarter sessions of this county to the court of the Queen's bench. So basically, she was trying to get him again. She was trying to get him to pay up again. And it came back and said, well, no, this, this order's already been quashed. It's already been reviewed by higher legal power. It's not happening. Mary, you're not getting your, uh, the maintenance money. And it, 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 it's, it certainly appears as though Robert has completely washed his hands of Mary and baby Anne. And that there are questions here, uh, one being why would Mary go to such length um, to secure the maintenance from, from um, Robert if, if, if he wasn't the father. So I, I, I have my own opinion on this and that is just an opinion, but, uh, you know, some might have a cynical view that uh, as Robert is repaired, referred to as a gentleman in some of these news clippings, that, that he was wealthy and perhaps Mary thought that she could make quite a good thing out of getting money from him. Um, or the other side, perhaps, um, perhaps Robert was the father and he he wanted to disassociate himself sorry disassociate himself um from an unfortunate messy alliance with with a servant girl because that that's what mary was she she was she was she was a, she was a humble servant so but we'll see what happens next. Uh, and the next the next place I headed to was the census. So, so 1851, um, and uh, apologies, you can't see it's quite small here. Sadly, in 1851, Mary is now in the workhouse. She is in the Eton Union workhouse, which I, I'm told was a model workhouse. Uh, she's a pauper and her, her profession is noted as a general servant. So this is why Mary does not appear in the 1851 census alongside her daughter Anne, um, who is with her maternal grandparents. But Mary isn't alone in the workhouse. No. Listed very faintly uh, beneath her entry are the words female, her child. So Mary is in the workhouse with her daughter, who is an eight day old baby girl. And baptism records reveal her to her name to be Charlotte Hannah Whedon, who was baptised on the 27th of April, 1851 at Upton Com uh, So Upton Com Chalvey is where the uh, Eton Union Workhouse was. And the father's name this time, you've guessed it, it was empty. Um, so it seems that following the birth of Anne, Mary has again had another child outside of wedlock. And again, this, uh, this, uh, this 
this story makes it to the press. And this is from the Windsor and Eaton Express, uh, the 28th of June, 1851. An order of affiliation was made on James George Beasley on the application of Mary Ann Whedon of Ivor. The defendant appeared and stated that it was his intention to marry the complainant in the course of a few weeks. Despite his good intentions, there is no record that I could find of James Beasley marrying Mary Whedon, um, although it seems he did not protest his paternity in this case. And, and after the 1851 census, Mary and her, her daughter Charlotte really fade into view, um, fade from view rather. This becomes, that's their, the, the conclusion of their story becomes a brick wall for me, um, a challenge for another day. However, um, thankfully, due to the, the census records, the baptism and newspaper records, we are able to tell part of Mary's story and the story of her elder illegitimate child, Anne Elizabeth, who went on to have a family of her own. And as for me, well, what do I think? Well, um, do I think Anne Elizabeth's father was Robert Edwards? And I I think, I'm, I'm thinking so, I, I'm thinking, I, you know, um, that's what I feel in my in my gut, and <laughs> um, I'm I, I, yeah. I just it, it's just that hunch, and uh, it might be wrong. So I looked into Robert Edwards a little bit more, and because I was able to learn from those newspaper reports that we, he was from Harlington, I was able to find um, a good match for for Robert. Um, I found uh, a Robert Edwards of Harlington in the 1841 census, and listed are his two brothers Thomas and John. And if you remember that newspaper report, um. Uh, Thomas and John Edwards paid his bail. So I'm thinking there's there's a connection there. Um, his father is named Elias and he is he appears to be a fairly well-to-do farmer. So I think there's probably a class issue here. I think uh, Robert Edwards was probably a cuss above Mary and fathered this child and just didn't want to have he didn't want to have anything to do with it. And he had the money and the resources to, to escape his uh, duty in paying the maintenance. And um, Robert Edwards pops up again in the 1881 census. He's a farmer in Harlington uh, with five acres and he's employing two men. So again, he's doing reasonably well. Uh, he has a servant named Kate and he's 56, he's unmarried and he lives with his unmarried sister, Hannah. Um, indeed, Robert Edwards never marries. He never officially has any children. So I really think it, it is the romantic in me that hopes Anne Elizabeth was his child so that he, he has a living legacy to this day. Um, and it was a legacy that at the time he wanted to deny, but we survived and, and we're still here. So, and that's an interesting one really, um, Robert. Um, so yes. So, um, on the back of this, um, I just wanted to highlight a couple of our sets that are, are really useful um, to trace those ancestors who were born outside of wedlock. And they are the uh, Warwickshire, Warwickshire Bastardy Indexes and the Lincolnshire Parish Bastardy Cases. And um, there's a really good point here just to touch a little further on that history of illegitimacy bastardy um, and it's in relation with the poor law so this this is this is sort of the the background to the um uh, mary's fight really to have that that maintenance paid so we go all the way back to 1235 to the statute of merton which is considered to be the first english statute which was passed by parliament during the reign of king henry iii and in this statute, the word uh, bastard is used. And the definition from 1235 is he is a bastard that is born before the marriage of his parents. Um, and the, the term continued for the ensuing centuries under the Elizabethan poor law of 1601. Um, responsibility uh, for the poor was given to the parish and illegitimate children were often included in the poor relief distributed by the parish. Now. Uh, to keep such children off the poor relief list, um, freeing up funds, um, efforts were made by the poor overseers to um, identify the father. So if identified, the father would then be ordered to pay maintenance of, for the child, like Robert Edwards. And if he did not pay, um, an order would be made for him to sell his possessions in order to cover the cost. 
By 1834, we see the law starting to change. Uh, the poor law amendment in that year stated that the Board of Guardians could initiate a hearing at the petty sessions to determine who the father was. And by 1844, as we see with Mary, the law changed so that a mother could initiate the proceedings herself. Um, so by the, by the 20th century, uh, the use of the word bastard had dropped away, thankfully. Uh, the Legitima Legitimacy Act of 1926 saw children born out of wedlock in England and Wales becoming legitimised if the parents later married. And um, crucially, the child, in this case, the child of unmarried parents, was then known as the illegitimate person. I see Bev asking a question, um, any for East London? We'd love that. We'll, we'll, we'll talk to our, our, our friends in licensing and, and see what we can, what we can do there. Uh, always, always on the hunt for new records, so this would be an excellent set to have. Um, so uh, let, let's take a uh, little um, uh, closer look at the, these two record sets here. And we'll, we'll start with Warwickshire. And uh, this particular collection was created by the Warwickshire County Record Office using records um, held at uh, the Warwickshire County Record Office. And they span the years 1884 to 1914. And we've got more than 5,000 records and they're, they're covering four types. So you've got the bastardy applications, registers, returns and appeals taken from the petty session. So compiled from those, those sort of um, uh the, the, the compiled from um, those sort of petty sessions that we saw uh, Mary involved with. So you'll find the mother's name here as well as the putative or alleged father's name, but not the name of the child. You will find the child's uh, birth year and their sex. So you can you can sort of work out the identity of, of the child, as we'll see. Um, but if the um, year of birth is blank, it means the child has not yet been born. And you'll also find... Um, uh, judgments in the case, so, so what the results of the, the case were. And the um, Lincolnshire Parish Varsity cases, uh, our, uh, the com sort of companion set, similar set, uh, they, spanned, they spanned several centuries, so they're beginning sort of 1700s, and there are nearly uh, 3,000 records in those, and they fall into three types of documents. So you've got um, your warrant, uh, which is an order to the alleged father to appear in court. You've got the maintenance order, which is issued by the Justice of the Peace at the Petty Sessions and orders the uh, individual to pay for a child's maintenance or indeed face prison. And finally, the the bond, which is that agreement to pay for the child. And you'll also find in this collection the father's name and the mother's name, uh, but not the name of the child. Uh, but you do get that birth year again. So you are able to work out who's being referred to. So let, let's have a little closer look. Um, so this is an example from the, the Warwickshire Varsity Indexes, and it's a Varsity application uh, made by one Rebecca Pinfield on the 19th of February, 1872. Now, that's the year that Rebecca's child was born. And there's a lot, a lot of detail in uh, the record transcription here. It's, it's really great. So we learn that uh, the putative father's name was John Dipple. Uh, he was John Dipple the Younger. So then that, that's quite helpful as well. Bit of a um, useful nugget there. And the judgment here is that the order is made. So it's basically been established that John Dipple is the father of Rebecca's child. Uh, and how was that proved? Well, there's a note here to say uh, witnesses named. So, you know, there were other people testifying uh, to the fact. And we also learned where this was happening. So this was at the Petty Sessions in Ulster, uh, in Warwickshire. So I grew curious about this case. I, I had to investigate it um, a little bit more. Um, and um, I found a 23-year-old Rebecca Pinfield working in Redditch, which is about um, 10 miles from Ulster, um, in the 1871 census. So Rebecca herself is an Ulster native, and she's a, a servant in the home of a bookseller, which is quite apt given our, our question of the week here. Ooh, all ties in. Um, and that was a complete accident. <laughs> and... Um, Looking at the birth index for a baby born in Ulster um, with the surname Pinfield in um, so, so the, the first quarter of 1872 to, to match the, the varsity index, um, I found an Ernest Henry E. Pinfield. So uh, little, little Ernest, he fits the bill here. Uh, there's no mother's maiden name recorded, which was a key uh, indicator of illegitimacy. Now, as we know, uh, we know that such cases were often reported in, in the local press at the time. I turn to our newspaper collection. 
And I found an article from the Ulster Chronicle from the 9th of March, 1872, and it reads, Rebecca Pinfield of Redditch appeared to proceed with a charge against a young man named Dipple of Ulster, upon whom she caused a summons to be served, charging him with being the father of her illegitimate child. So we have the right Rebecca in the 1871 census uh, as she is living in Redditch. Yeah, so yeah, case adjourned. Yeah, Victoria's on it. Did it happen? So yeah, it would, it would, it would roll on to the next session. And and as we know from the record that we we did get a judgment and that went in Rebecca's favour. Um, so um, and yeah, even though it says as it says in the newspapers, and there's a lovely sort of flash of character from Rebecca that um because Dipple did not appear at the hearing, um, she would rather have the case heard that day, but um, sadly she, she didn't get her wish. Um, so, oh, we've got Karen here. Oh yes, third time great grandmother's born in a legitimate case made to Henry Curtis in Lincolnshire, have proved it with this child. Uh, DNA, that's, that's a very good shout, that's a very good shout. So if I wanted to, to clarify my Robert Edwards theory, perhaps I need to, I need to look for some of Edwards relatives um, there. So, uh, this was a really sad story, actually. Um, little baby Ernest was only, um, he didn't, he didn't live for very long. So he, he, um, he passed away in late 1872, bless his heart. And um, I just found this quite moving as if I hadn't really stumbled across uh, Rebecca's record that, you know, he's, he might have been lost to time, but we have his record. And um, I, I find, I find that quite profound. Um, and as for Rebecca, well, she, she died 10 years later in 1881. She was only 33. So a really sort of sad snapshot um, from Victorian um, Warwickshire there. But we'll move on to Lincolnshire. Um, and this is a slightly, this has a slightly a happy ending, I promise. And we'll end on, we'll end on a high. Um, so this is an example from the Lincolnshire Parish Varsity cases. And these records go back uh, further in time. And this is an example of a transcription from 1795. And it's a bastardry warrant raised by a single woman, Frances Langston in Spitalgate, uh, which is a parish in Grantham. Now this was raised on the 3rd of July, 1795 against Nathaniel Wilson, who was a paper maker, and their child, it says, was born in 1795. So this was the warrant, so that's the order for Nathaniel to be to appear in court. And um, but what happened next? And um, I turned to our wonderful um, Lincolnshire Parish registers to find out. Uh, I've got Lincolnshire family, and the, these records have been absolutely um, invaluable um, uh, for tracing my family tree. And what did I find here? Well, it's a marriage record. Um, from 7th of July, 1795, between Francis Langston and one Nathaniel Wilson, a widower. So this is the 7th of July, 1795, and it's, so that's four days after the warrant, uh, the bastardry warrant was issued. Um, so Nathaniel has no doubt decided that instead of paying maintenance, um, he's actually going to marry Francis. So, uh, Nathaniel was a widower, uh, Francis was a spinster, and they married um, St. Wolfram. Uh, they married at St. Wolfram in Spitalgate in Grantham. And we can actually see the marks here, uh, their marks here on the marriage register from the parish where they were married by uh, the, the vicar there, Thomas Easton. The curious thing again about, about this, this, particularly, this particular bastardy application was that Francis's and Nathaniel's child was not actually born at the time of the, the wedding. Um, the baptism register for St Wolfram's in Grantham tells us that a Thomas Wilson, son of Nathaniel, and Francis Wilson was born on the 20th of July 1795 and was baptised two days later on the 22nd of July 1795. So a heavily pregnant Francis had forced Nathaniel's hand essentially by issuing him with his bar city warrant and uh, as I saw Andrew um, there we go. Uh, it's probably cheaper to marry. And yeah, it, it's a good point. It's a good point. Um, so, I mean, perhaps perhaps um, perhaps he was um, dilly dallying and um, uh, 
you know, intended to marry her. I don't know, maybe he was dragging his feet and she just sort of forced the issue by, by issuing um, issuing a warrant. And so Thomas actually ends up being born in wedlock, um, despite his parents' names being included in the varsity indexes. Um, and we can see this entry, this is, this is diligent vicaring here. And I, my, my, my father was a vicar, so um, we, we shout out the diligent uh, uh, vicaring. And the, the vicar has actually included the date of the baptism on the left and then on the column on the right he's added in at uh, the date of birth and you, you know it always varies with these older baptism registers so it's really useful to to check those these the, the um the uh the original image and, and have a look because this was sort of able to confirm that that thomas was a, a, actually born um in wedlock um so <laughs> karen's saying i mean we must be related so many similarities in our family i i think we are i think we are there's wonderful stuff so um, to, to wrap up, um, this this ended up being being um, a fruitful partnership, I suppose, between Francis and Nathaniel. Uh, they had um, more children: Elizabeth, Anne, John, Francis, and James. Uh, they all followed. So Francis has five children between 1798 and 1804. Six years, five children. That's um, gosh, <laughs> bless them. So um, yeah, we hope Francis's story has a, has a bit more um, of a happier ending than Rebecca Pinfield's and, and Mary Whedon's. And the, these tools, the record sets that we have here at Find My Pass are so vital for uncovering these potentially otherwise hidden stories of legitimacy. So yeah, I, I'm, off to, I'm off to do some more digging, I think. I, I've, got a, I've got a lot to do. I, I'd like to trace these, these Wilson children. And I, I need to find out what happened to Mary Whedon as well. Um, that is one of my elusive brick walls. I might have to enlist um, Ellie and Jessamy to to help me with that. Um, so everyone, um, happy research this evening and this weekend. Um, thank you so much for joining me. I uh, really enjoyed today. And actually, I'll be I'll be back with you very soon um, because there's a particular uh, event of national importance coming up in, in a few weeks. Um, so I'll be I'll be hosting a, a coronation special, I think, uh, in a fortnight. Um, so I, I will see you then, and um, we'll be of course with you next week. So thank. You so much for joining us. Have a lovely weekend and take care. Goodbye.